everyone. Good morning. We are going to begin. This is going to be the final class this summer. I'm happy to whoever joined. I really, I think this series, Places and People in Israel, I've been doing for a year. I, right. Corona started a year ago, and that's when they started online. And it has really been amazing. Thank you to everyone that joins and, and keeps it going and learns with me about new places in Israel. Today, we are going to learn about a place that almost everyone who has come to Israel has been to, but I'm, we're going to discover things that most people that have gone to this place do not know. And it just shows how Israel has so many different layers. And if you go to a place again and again and again, and even hear about the same thing, I've been to the old city maybe 50 times. And every time there's a tour of an old city with a tour guide that I never heard of, I jump to go because I always like learning new things. So the place we're going to be discussing today is En Gedi. En Gedi, most people associate with waterfalls, caves where David HaMelech hid, as it says in Tanakh. And it's such a great stop for any trip because the kids get to swim, adults get to swim, gorgeous in the middle of the desert. And it, it's very familiar and popular place. So we are going to be talking about En Gedi. However, I'm going to share things that most people don't tell you about in Getty because once you see water, you want to jump in and you don't want to sit and listen to the history. A little bit you do. Um, this I usually do on the bus, but next time you go, this could be your focus of in Getty. So let me share my screen with you. And I love talking. I, I, and, and I'm just going to add that normally I go to in Getty about eight times a year. This year, I don't even know that I've been once. <laughs> Embarrassed to say. So let me share my screen. Ah, why is it not working? Okay. So this class is entitled The Secrets of Anne Getty because I want to share things that are not so well known. Depicted is a boy and a girl that are fighting, brother and sister, let's call them. And a lot of times when siblings fight, they throw lines at each other. And sometimes siblings might tell one another, I'm going to kill you. It's something that people say, they don't mean it, but it's something you say when you fight. Now, I want to take this line because I want to tell you about a discovery. In 1966, in Engedi, there was a dig. Now, what you're looking at is a mosaic from a shul. On top of the shul is this white tent. When you go to En Gedi, you almost always see it, but you don't really pay attention because you're so excited to go to the waterfalls and everything else. But this in itself could be a whole visit, part of a whole visit. They, in 1966, the kibbutz of En Gedi, they wanted to have more farmland. So they started digging and all of a sudden they see mosaics. And when they see mosaics, they unearth it more and they say, wow, look what we have here, this mosaic from a shul. We can't do a farming over here. We have to do it somewhere else. And I want to share with you something very specific and very unique that was found on this mosaic. So if you look to the left over here, you see that it's long. This was a mosaic that they found. And there's a lot of writing carved in. The really exciting thing is it's a few thousand years old and we can still read it. And it's written in Hebrew. And I want to call your attention uh, later on. Um, we might talk about the different sections, but now I want to focus on this section over here. And what it says, translated into English is, whoever reveals the secret of this place to foreigners, the all-knowing and all-seeing God will punish this man and destroy his offspring and everyone should enter. Amen. Wow. <laughs> what a threat. Interesting to find a threat on a mosaic of a shul. And even more interesting is, what is the secret that they're talking about? Whoever reveals the secret, and it's a very uh, big curse. God will punish this man and destroy his offspring. What is the secret of En Gedi? So that is one of the things we are going to discover today. What is the secret of En Gedi? Along with a few other questions, where in Israel can you find a long last perfume? And do they ever find the killing of the Beit HaMikdash? Now, before you jump and say no, <laughs> you think no, well, let's say. Where is En Gedi? En Gedi is about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes away from Jerusalem. It's overlooks the Dead Sea. It's a beautiful, beautiful drive, and it's amazing to get there. You get to fresh water, and we understand why David HaMelech would go and hide in En Gedi, because it's fresh water you can drink, which is hard to find in a desert. So that is En Gedi. This is what it looks like. You, 
gorgeous waterfalls to swim in the water is clear it's just such a fun place to be and as i mentioned in the opening usually this is people's focus which is totally fine because i would also only care about this if i went now there's so much more and i think probably the time to learn about it is maybe not being at Getty because we're focused by other things but to just come with this understanding or come another time um, with this so what you so uh, I'm gonna give a little bit hint. The secret of Ain Getty has to do with something that they grow. Now, what did they used to grow there that they didn't want anyone to talk? So one option, <laughs> one option could could be date trees. And we see here even nowadays, as you drive along the Dead Sea, there's a lot of date trees growing. And one of the reasons is because date trees need two conditions to grow. They need a lot of water and they need a lot of heat. So it's very dry in the desert, that's perfect. And in terms of a lot of water. The lucky thing is date trees don't need it to be fresh water. It can be salty water. So they get all everything that they need in this area. And date trees did in fact grow at En Gedi. However, that's not a secret. Everyone knows how to grow a date tree. So that can be it. I want to um, go a minute into a few sources. When Shalomu HaMelech was king, kingdoms came from all over the place to give him presents and to see his greatness and see his wealth and advise with him. And there's the Pasuk in Melachim Aleph that Malkat Sheva, the Queen of Sheba, comes to Shlomo HaMelech. And it says that she gives him Ubsamim had bemeod, uh, tons of besamim, um, good smelling spices, perfume. And then it says, Lo ba chabosim ahu od larov. Ashed natana Malkat Sheva lemelech Shlomo. Never again had anyone given Shlomo HaMelech such an abundance of spices, of perfume. What was the perfume that she gave? Let's put it on the spine. Well, <laughs> actually, I'm going to answer that question. The Chachamim say that the perfume that she gave him, that the Tanakh uh, outright mentions the Pasuk and says, never again did we get this much or this amount. The Chachamim say this is something known as a Simon. Now, I'm not going to translate a Simon for a reason. We're going to we're gonna stick with the Hebrew word. This was what Makat Sheva brought to Shalom HaMelech. What is it today? That would be amazing if we could figure out what it is today. Because if it's something so sweet smelling and amazing, and this is what she's bringing him, I want to know what it is. Now, other areas in Tanakh where Boston is mentioned, in Shira Shirim, Dodi Arad Leganon, Al Gotha Boston, Leot Paganim, Lekot Shoshanim. Interesting thing, right next to Engedi is a place called Nachal Arugot. Arugot means like flower beds. So here we have in Shira Shirim going down to beds of Boston, where Boston is growing. The Chachamim also say in the Tanakh, when we have the word Ataf mentioned, that's Afar Simon, and then Pituma Ketoret, we see in this Pasuk, one of the spices um, put in the Ketoret is Nataf. And when Yaakov Avinu sent his son down to Yosef, he doesn't know it's Yosef, the, the foreign ruler that wants the Yamin and has Shibon in jail, he says, bring some things from the land. And one of the things they bring, it says Ma'at Sodi, and the Chachamim also say that Sodi is so Nataf, sorry, and Bosom all Afar Simon. So it's clearly something valuable if Makat Sheva is bringing it, if Shira Shirim mentions it, if it's in the Ketoret, if this is something that Yaakov tells his sons to put down. And now I want to illustrate a few more examples um, to, to show how valuable it was. In Masachat uh, Sanhedrin, it says that when someone had Shemen Afar Simon, Afar Simon Oya, he didn't want to leave it in his house unguarded because he knew someone would steal it. So what would he do? He said, let me give it to someone for safekeeping. So he would go to somebody rich because he said, if someone's rich, they probably have good safekeeping. And the rich person, where is he going to keep the Afar Simon? He's going to keep it in his safe, in his safe with all his gold and jewelry because it's something valuable on that caliber. And then what would they do? So this is actually a method that, some, that they would use to steal from the rich people. Then they would sit and smell that far someone and follow the scent. And where would the scent lead them? The scent would lead them to the riches. So that was one of the things that the that is mentioned in Masachat Sanhedrin about how they use the far someone, but not for the good. Another example in Sefer Ishayahu, it says it's talking about one of the reasons why Yerushalayim is being destroyed, and it talks about the women and it says how the women used to dress and how they used to walk and what they used to do. So we see the pasuk over here. And the Midrash on this says that what, what, did, in Echa, what did the women do? So if you look at their shoes, those high heels, um, they had high heels back then, I'd imagine a little bit different. 
the woman would take the Shem Simon and they would put it in something called, it mentions here in the Midrash, Shaitan Mevia Zefek Shel So if you look over here, Zefek, Zefek in English is a crop. It's a section of a rooster that is for, used for storage. So she would take this, she would tie it to her shoe in, be oops, in between her heel and the shoe part. And then when she would see men, that, this woman would see men that she was interested in, she would step hard and then it would break the crap that has the Shemana Far Simon. And then the smell would come out and the, the men would be so entranced by the smell that they would go and follow the woman. So that was another use of Afar Simon to seduce men and all this is written in the sources. And another uh, source I want to share with you to show the value of the Afar Simon, Cleopatra, when she was in conversation with Mark Anthony, she said, I want you to bring me from the Afar Simon orchards of Yericho, of Jericho. This is what I want. So I think we proved it's something very valuable, valuable in terms of the uses in the Tanakh and even after, what is this Afar Simon? What is this magical tree? Is it a tree? Is it a bush? Is it a flower? So first thing I want to say that it's not. Afar Simon today in Hebrew is a word that's used. Parsimon, if you look, uh, you see depicted, if I go to the shuk in Israel and I ask for Afar Simon, this is what they're going to give me. But that's not it. That's it today. It was a, a tree um, from China in the 20th century. Someone introduced it, Afar Simon. This is the modern Parsimon. But this is not what Afar Simon was in the Tanakh. It's not a perfume. It's, it's not, it tastes good, but it's not super valuable. So that's also one of the reasons why I don't want to translate it because of, well, actually that works against my translation. It's just translation in that, in that case, so we don't think it's the orange fruit that we eat today. But it's not a parsimon. What is it? So if we go back to the Tanakh, Makat Sheva brought Shalom HaMelech a lot of uh, bosem. And we said bosem is a parsimon. And the Chachamim say she most probably came from Yemen. That's where Sheva is. And in Yemen, let's go look at the trees. So in Yemen, they have a group of trees, different kinds of trees. And from those trees, they make perfumes. And after discovering and testing and seeing and trying, what they say is most probably the Afar Simon is a tree known as Camaphora gileadensis. Now you understand why I'm not translating because that's a mouthful of my, to, to say that name, I'd rather just call it Afar Simon much shorter and easier. Where can we find this? Can we in fact find in Israel? So here's a, 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 an enlarged picture and I'm gonna show you um, in another picture how it looks big here, like it looks like you could see a plum, but it's really, really tiny. It's just very enlarged. And there's two professors, Professor Yehuda Felix and Professor Zohar Amar, who after intense research and looking at sources said, we really believe that this is in fact the ancient Afar Simon. And Professor Yehuda Felix, he wrote this book on um, all botany in the Tanakh, all plants. He did investigation of what it really is. So these are really people with authority that say, we think this is Afar Simon. Where can you find this in Israel? Right, so exciting, where is it? So in Kibbutz and Gedi and Kibbutz Amog, they are growing these Afar Simon trees. Now um, Ed, I'm going to give you a new place to visit. I said and Gedi you probably have been to, maybe not the Shul of and Gedi, which is cool to go and see this. There's this place. It's been around, I think it's at least eight years, maybe longer, called the Chavat Afar Simon, the first Afar Simon farm. And I'm going to show you in a minute on the map where it is. And there's this man who is growing the Afar Simon, and his ambition is he wants to make the perfume, as was made back then. And when you, you can go with your family, you pay one price for the whole family. I've gone three times um, with Brooks. We had a lot of fun. He gives you a tour, especially if you like plants. I know a lot of people like plants and smelling different things and tasting things. So he takes you around his farm uh, and shows you all different kinds of plants and talks about what you could use with them. And then at the end, he has um, all these really cool things that he made. And it's, it's great to hear his story and how committed he is. Now, the man that started this, he's not religious, and he has an intense amount, amount of interest from religious people because if all of a sudden he's growing all of these ancient plants and we said you could use it in the Ketoret, and hey, so then, that, that, then it connects to the Beit HaMikdash. And he had there's this um, organization in Israel called Machon HaMikdash that they built the Kelim of the Beit HaMikdash because they said when we build the third Beit HaMikdash, we need to be ready. 
and th this man is in constant talks with them because they're so interested in what he's doing and he's doing something so biblical. And he even said, he said, it's so ironic because I'm not religious at all. And now I have all re religious interests in it. So uh, he works with them and he's trying to develop the perfume. So here's, um, th this is the guy over here in a hat, wearing a hat and he's showing, this is the Afar Simon tray. Um, you see now you could get a, a better understanding of the size. And here's a group that I was with. We were taking a tour. There's all different kinds of plants and it's gorgeous. Over here are uh, gorgeous mountains and across, right across if we were looking the other way from where I took the picture is the Dead Sea. So it's a really fun place to be. Now you could get <laughs> a better idea of the size. Right in the other picture, it looked like it was the size of a plum. So that is my hand and you see my nail and it's smaller than my nail. Now here is the really cool part what the guy did. He took his knife and he didn't even, he didn't give us one of the fruits. He made a scratch on the bark, a little tiny scratch. And he said, everyone smell. And we're all sitting and smelling it. Enough for 30 people, one scratch. And it really, really did smell very good. Now this is not the perfume because it's just the bark. But if the bark smells good, I can imagine what the actual perfume would smell like. And he gave us an opportunity at the farm to do something that I had never ever done in my life. And it, it brought me to tears then. And really every time I go and do it, I get very, very excited when I can do mitzvot that I never did before. Because we grow up, you have a certain amount of mitzvot usually that you could keep, but you get married and then you could do some more as a woman. And it's pretty much it. How, how often do you get the opportunity to do a new mitzvah? But he gave us an opportunity. Um, I'm going <laughs> to explain in a second what the opportunity was. I just want to pause and say that when you smell something nice, we know that there's different perachot you can make depending on what it is. And when you make kadala, depending on what you're using, you make a beracha. If you're walking in the street and you're smelling something really good, a plant, you can make a beracha too. So what we all assume is, okay, we're smelling this really great tree. We'll say, uh, and what he told us, and he said he got the approval of the rabbinate, and he is in conversations with religious people. He said there is a special beracha that the, that the only thing it said on is on a farsimon. Now, if we're making a beracha on a farsimon, it better really be a farsimon, or it's beracha levatala. And after all the research, everyone concluded that this really is it. What is the beracha? The Barakha is, and in a Shulchan Aruch, it says, it, it lists different things in the different Barakha. So, Al Shemen Afar Simon, it says, Bore Shemen Arev, who makes sweet um, oil. And we, he told us all, he said, You guys are welcome to make this Barakha and with Shem Hashem because we're actually blessing the Afar Simon. So, there I am. I'm like, Wow, I get to make Barakha on something I never did in my entire life on something I never saw in my entire life and something I never smelled in my entire life because the real secret here is the smelling, not the, not the seeing. And it was really cool. And I felt, oh, how special that I live in Israel and can make a beracha and something like this. So that's also an additional thing that you could do. Um, if all this is not exciting enough, if you get really excited by saying new berachot and making new mitzvah, that's reason enough to go here. And, and it's a fun thing. Most people have not done this, not gone to the farm. You could, um, to find out more info, if you type in jerichovalley.com, you'll see information. The website's in Hebrew and English. Now, where is this Afar Simon farm? So you see how Google Translate is persimmon farm. It's not persimmon, but it's uh, actually on the way. If you were going to Engedi, you could stop by it on the way. If you're going to Masada, it's on the way. Or even if this is where you want to go as your way, it's about 45 minutes, I think even less here. I Googled that it's traffic and time. It's about a half hour from Jerusalem, and it's a, a really, really fun experience. Okay. So the next natural question, if we have the plant, do we know how to make the perfume? And to answer this question, I want to give you an analogy. Depicted here is tahine, you see in a jar or ready-made. Now you can go to a hundred different houses. Every single person's house you go to, it will taste different. Everyone uses the same basic ingredients. You put the taste, you put water, lemon, salt. You can add garlic and kumun if you want. And even if someone, even if two people use the exact same thing, the exact same spices and the exact same amounts, it still would taste different because it depends who makes it. There's just something about who makes it. Same thing if you make a cake, how come one person's Dunkin' Hot cake tastes good and the other one tastes less good? It just, <laughs> uh, a case that what I'm proving is that you can have the ingredients from something, but it doesn't mean it'll come outside. 
So that's the exact same thing with the Afar Saman. Okay, we have the plant, but who knows how to make it? Now, we actually, um, Josephus and another historian named um, Plinius, the elder, they write in their books how to make a Afar Saman. They said, this is how you do it. You have two pools. One has water in it. And you put the Afar Saman in and the oil, it floats to the top. And then it goes to the next pool. And there you go. You have a Afar Saman. Okay, great. We have a description. But you heard my description was still kind of vague. How big is the pool? How long do you leave it in? They don't sit and describe these kind of things. So our task is to continue searching and trying to find out what this special perfume is. And we saw all the amazing values it had, how it was really a huge thing. If this is Malkat Sheva is bringing to Shalama, then it is something <laughs> that's worth smelling. And I told you, even a small scratch on the bark smells good. So how much more if you make it into the perfume? So that is the sec one of the secrets of En Gedi that the, was written in the mosaic. Whoever reveals the secret will be cursed. That will, now we don't know for sure that that's what it was, but we have a good reason to think that the secret was that in En Gedi they knew how to make a person. Okay. The next question I want to focus on, and you'll see how it connects to uh, En Gedi in a minute, is did they ever find the Kelim of the Beit HaMikdash? In the 1950s, something that was going on very frequently was theft of antiquities. Why? Because in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in caves in the Judean Desert, not far from in Gedi, where we're talking about. And people said, wow, if all these scrolls and the, the world went crazy when they found them, which is another reason why everyone went so crazy from them, all these scrolls are found in these caves, I wonder what else is found. And uh, people started searching, now who are the people? If it's archaeologists and they're doing an organized way, documented everything, great. But there were rumors that there were Jordanians that were coming over the border and they're sitting and searching in the caves and then they'd steal, steal it and sell it on the black market. Now, these rumors were found to be true when the Israelis would go to caves and they'd see um, cigarette boxes from the Jordanians and leftover food. They said, hey, they were here first and they already stole it. So what are we going to do? So they went to um, the archaeologist, one of the archaeologists went to Ben Gurion and said, Ben Gurion, help us, but what are we going to do? And he spoke to the Ramatkal, who's the head of the army, and said, What could we do about this? And he gave great advice. He said, Let's let's be on the offensive side instead of defensive. Defensive. Instead of waiting for them to steal and then responding to that, let's do something proactive. Why don't you organize your own archaeological expeditions and go find what's there? <laughs> Anyway, that's the end goal that we want to find what's there. And he said, and the army will, will protect you. We'll make sure nothing bad happens to you. And that's exactly what they did. And in the, the 19, end of the 1950s, 1960s, they had organized archaeological expeditions. So there were two major ones. And there were three archaeologists. And they, they divided the territory. So if you look, here's the Dead Sea. And if you look up here, here's En Gedi, and a little bit uh, further south, we have Nachal Chavid, Nachal Mishman, Nachal Zeilu. So this is where digs were done. And this in itself is, is a whole uh, another talk because they found in some of the caves remains from the times of Bar Kochta, they found Tchelet, they found writing, letters. So it's amazing what's hiding in caves and how fun would it be to discover what's in a cave. If I, I remember, when I was in Israel from Brothers Bar Mitzvah years ago, my brothers were always walking with their heads down. Why down? Look up, look at the view. Because they wanted to find coins. They wanted to find things. And every, really every week, you read in the newspaper, if you follow Israeli news, they're always discovering something new. And it's not always by archaeologists. Sometimes it's really just a little boy that was out on a hike with his friend and he found something. And then and you're not going to keep what you find. You need to report it to the Antiquities Authority. And it's still always finding things. So I understand why my brothers walked with their heads down. They didn't find anything. Huh? Now, the, the specific cave and area I want to focus on is known as Nacha Mishmar. In 1960, so they go and they dig there. And they find in a corner, wrapped up in this... In Hebrew, I don't really know what to call it in English. Kind of a rug. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. They find all, all of a sudden these hundreds of copper vessels that are very high quality, very good workmanship, valuable. And as they're finding it and they keep finding more and more and more, they said, oh my gosh, we found the vessels of the Beit HaMikdash. They said, it, it has to be such an abundance in such great condition. 
And as they say that they break out in songs, singing Iban Hamikdash, they're so excited and rumors are flying all day. Someone says we found the menorah. Every, everyone's gone crazy from this find that they found in this game. So as they're looking at, at what they find, so this is an original picture from back then. Someone looks at something and he sees a, a, a neshet, he sees an eagle and he says, oh, this must be from the top of Bakofa because the eagle, the vulture was the symbol of Rome. So if this is on one of the vessels, it must be from Rome, Tav of Bakofa. And then they break out another song. Oh, we found stuff from Bakofa. And they don't really know what they find, but they're so, so, so excited because we know that the Kelim, the Beit HaMadash, we don't know where the Menorah is. Maybe it's in Rome, you know, it was taken to Rome. The Adol and the Shekhan is so much. And even if we're not talking about the big ones, they had trumpets and just tons of stuff, the Beit HaMadash, tons of gold and silver. Or you could read about it in Sefer Melachim. Then at the end of the day, they say, okay, let's look at everything organized. And they lay everything out. And they conclude that although it would be amazing if it was from the Beit HaMadash, and they would be so excited from it is not actually from the Beit HaMadash. The amount of things that they found, they found 429 different vessels made of copper. And they said it's not even from the time of Bar Kochva because it predates Bar Kochva by 3,000 years. Here is a colored picture. It's all copper of things that they found. They, here's kind of a crown and they found a lot of uh, these like ram heads and, and shovels and all kinds of things. In total, they found 429 vessels, which is a lot. And they're not broken, they're in great condition. And here's another example of the collection. Where, when is this from? So we said it's it's not it's before the Bar Kochba period. It's something known as the Chalcolithic Age, which is in between the Stone Age and the Bronze Age. So it's really, really, really old. And they found all this stuff. If you want to go see this today, if you go to the Israel Museum, which has the best findings, you can see all of it behind glass. What they thought was from the Beit Hamidash, and in fact, was it predated the Beit Hamidash. And what is the connection of all this to Engedi? So we said it was found near Engedi, about 10 kilometers away. And what was actually found in Engedi? So if, when you go to Engedi, if you go swim in the waterfalls, then you dry off, you're ready to continue. If you hike up a bit, you will see um, remains, remains. What is the remains of? So archeologists in the sixties are looking at this and they say, well, we see this squarish kind of structure. It's a low wall. We see some something circular in the beginning, in the middle, this is a circular thing. We think that this is an ancient temple because it matches the, what they looked like a long time ago. And they found the how proven they found ashes and they found bones of animals. They said, we think this is the temple. And when are we dating it back? We're dating it back to the Chalcolithic age that we just spoke about, which all those vessels are found up. Now, there's something they didn't find, however. They did not find a single vessel. They didn't find a single tool, nothing to make sacrifices with. It was just empty. And in Nachal Mishmar, in the cave, what did they find? They found tools, but no temple. So what the archaeologists do? They put two and two together. They said, all these vessels we found 10 kilometers away must be from this temple. And archaeologists guess, and I say guess because no one really knows for sure, especially since thousands of years ago, that the temple was left in an organized fashion. We don't know why, but the people just left and then they, they buried their vessels in a cave nearby. So this is also another really cool um, thing that you can go and visit in Engedi, an ancient temple, and then you can tell the story of how they almost found the Kadim of the Bantam Dash. They thought they did. I can't even imagine what kind of excitement that is. And this you can visit at Engedi or at the Israel Museum. What time it is? Okay. Um, I want to add in one more thing as a bonus. We said what are the secrets of Engedi, and I mentioned the shul. I mentioned one inscription on the shul, and now I just want to talk about a few others because there's way more to see there, and after this will end. So we focused over here on this third inscription, which was, uh, you see over here, Amen Amen Sela, whoever reveals the secret of this place should be cursed. Now, the first one is really, I love how if you read Hebrew, you could even read it out. It's not the new handwriting, but it says, Adam Shet Enosh, Kehan Mahalal. For those of you familiar with Sefer Divrei Hayamim, this is the first pasuk in Sefer Divrei Hayamim. The generations um, are mentioned starting from Adam. So if you ever want to me uh, memorize the generations quickly, if you go to Divrei Hayamim, you have a, a cheat sheet. So that's one of the things, I don't know of any other shuls that 
has something like this, the classic Ibn Ibn Hayyam in Britain, but they have that in this shul. And it's it's very cool to go and see, especially since you could read it. A lot of times in Aramaic, you can't read it or understand it unless you speak Aramaic and understand Aramaic. Now, the next section, it has the mazalot. So there are shuls in Israel, and we spoke about this when we uh, discussed Tveria, that have, like, it's called Dalgala mazalot, a wheel, and on each side they have each month and the, the horoscope symbol. So here they don't have it in pictures, they just have it listed. And then we have the months of the year that we're familiar with, Tushem, Al Chashwan, Kislev, Tebet, Shabbat, Adar. Then we have these words, Chananya, Mishael, and Azaria, who are people listed in Sefer Daniel and Shema Yisrael. So this is the second one, names in the Mazalot of the months, and this uh, third one we already spoke about the cards. And then the fourth section is talking about the thinking donors um, from the shul, which is today we think donors, back then we think donors too. So all this is just on one piece of mosaic that you could say now, this mosaic was taken, cleaned, and, and put back because they wanted to be able to see everything that's written. Another thing I want to tell you that was discovered here, which is also mind-blowing, I want you to look at this. What is it? I don't know. Archaeologists didn't know either. For 45 years, it sat in the laboratory. Now, the shul was destroyed in the 6th century, either by the Byzantines or by the Muslims. We're not really sure. It was built a few times, the 3rd century, the 5th century, the 6th century. And they saw something that it looked, it didn't look like a regular piece of ash. They said, we think this is something, let's save it. And they had it saved in a lab. And 45 years later, uh, an American lab developed a technology to uncover what it was. And they unrolled it and they saw that this, in fact, was a piece of Sefet Torah. And the pasuk that it found, the Bera Ben Yisrael Amata Alehem, Adam Ki Akriv Mikem Korban Ladonai Mina Behemal Min Matar Min Akar Akriva. So it's, a, I think it's like so cool. What are the chances they found it all burnt up and it's talking about Korban or what you burn? And this is also something that they found in this shul from Engedi. It was used in a few different centuries. One of the times it was used in the times of the Mishnah and the Gemara. And all this is without even going to the typical um, spot that people are used to in Engedi. So go visit the shul. It's so cool. There's so much to talk about, so much to say. To summarize, we opened up and closed, speaking about the synagogue. And the, we specifically we focused on the inscription that whoever reveals the secret of Engedi will be cursed, that his children will be cursed. What is the secret? We said the secret is the Shemin Afar Simon. So Afar Simon mentioned the Tanakh. Machat Shabbat brings it as a present. Yaakov sends the brothers down with some Afar Simon. We understood the value when we saw it mentioned in the Midrashim and mentioned in the Gemara as, as something that when people wanted to steal, they put it by the rich people and follow the smell. The women would use it. We said we could go and find the Afar Simon after speaking so much about it in the Afar Simon farm. And you could make the unique beracha of Borei Shem and Arev. Then we went back to Engedi and said, if we continue a little bit more, we can see this remains of a temple. We don't have the vessels from the temple that maybe, if they in fact were from that temple, same time period, were found in a cave nearby. When the people discovered it, they said, oh my gosh, we found the vessels of Beit HaMikdash. We were disappointed that it was not, nevertheless, an amazing find, 429 pieces, which you can see at the Israel Museum. And we ended with uh, a few more surprises at the shul. Bottom line message, go visit Angeti. It's making me want to go and visit it and see uh, what I haven't seen in a while. Thank you so much for joining. I want to wish you a wonderful rest of the summer. Thank you for joining me all these weeks. I loved being here and speaking about Nitzisrael, which is a topic that I love. And have a great day.